I am often asked if there is an alternative to Vladimir Putin. Well, you're watching Vladimir Putin using the powerful Soviet-style repressive machine to try and destroy that alternative right before your eyes. The regime targets the most courageous, the most principled, those Russians who risk not only their freedom, but very often their lives to show you that Russia can be different. That was the wife of Russian opposition activist and journalist Vladimir Karamurza. He's the 42-year-old Russian-British journalist who has spent the last two years behind bars in Russia after he was convicted of treason last year for denouncing the war in Ukraine. He's currently serving a 25-year sentence. His wife, who lives in the U.S. with their three children, joined several members of Congress on Capitol Hill on Tuesday pleading for Russia to free her husband. The lawmakers joined her in demanding Karim Mirza's release. Joining us now, Democratic Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. He's chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he was at that Tuesday meeting alongside Karim Mirza's wife. And Caddy Kay has the first question for you, Senator. Caddy? Senator, thank you for joining us. I mean, listening to Evgenia Karamurza there, she sounds a little bit like, sadly, Julia Navalny taking up the baton of her husband who's behind bars. She, she told all of you that she worries that her husband's right, life is actually in danger. And after what happened to Navalny, that clearly is something that we can't take lightly. You said that um, he will never be forgotten, that you won't allow him to be forgotten. But what practically can the United States do in the case of somebody like Kara Mirza, who's spoken out against Ukraine and has been convicted on charges of treason? Well, first, it's good to be with you. Uh, let me be clear. I think his life is at risk. Uh, Mr. Putin uh, twice uh, tried to poison uh, Mr. Kara Mirza. Uh, so he's already been a target for potential being murdered. Uh, we know what happened to Mr. Navalny in prison. We know what happened to Mr. Bignitsky in prison. Their fate was sealed because they dared to disagree with the, the Putin regime. So, yes, we are very concerned about Mr. Karamursa's health. And that's why we want to put a spotlight on the fact that he has been held wrongly. Uh, we would like to see him designated as an unlawful detained person uh, in our own State Department so that we can give him more help and visibility globally for his release. We are committed to doing everything we can to get him home safely with his wife and children. Uh, they won't let us, won't let anyone communicate with them, including his, his family or, or lawyers. So we have a writing campaign. That's what we did this week. Uh, I participated. I sent him a letter. I told him I, I want him back home, and when he's back home, we're going to give him better food than he's getting in the Russian prisons. I invited him to join me for some Senate bean soup and to take a stroll in the National Mall rather than having to be in that prison. So we're not going to forget him. We're going to do everything we can to bring him home safely. But, but what is the everything that you can do? I mean, to some extent, America can't even get Evan Gorskovich out, who's been in jail for a year now. There, it, the whole way that Putin is playing this, shutting up dissidents, taking Americans, I mean, it's revealing a sort of powerlessness in the United States. Is there more that America could do in actual practical terms? Well, first, we put a spotlight on the case. We're not going to forget him. We're going to make sure that the international community knows exactly what Mr. Putin has done uh, so that he is not forgotten. Secondly, there are sanctions that have been imposed, and there are additional sanctions that we can impose on Russia. We're looking at those types of sanctions. This is nothing against the Russian people. This is against Mr. Putin and his government. And then there are talks that take place. We're not naive. We know that there are certain discussions taking place uh, in regard to the UK. After all, Mr. Karamursa is a dual citizen of Russia and UK uh, and the United States with Russia. And we hope that part of those negotiations will result in the release of Mr. Karamursa. Senator, uh, as, as you deal with trying to get the release of Karamursa, how does the fact that it seems like some of your colleagues uh, in the Republican, on the Republican uh, side of the House, seem to be uh, trying to, at best, 
uh, be uh, easy on Putin, easy on Russia yeah. when it comes to Ukraine funding and other uh, issues. And clearly the presumptive nominee of their party has, is all but pro-Putin. How does that factor in, if at all, in what you're trying to do to free this unjustifiably held prisoner? Well, Reverend, uh, Mr. Putin is not only at war against his own people for disagreeing with his policies, he's at war with Ukraine and other countries in Europe are in his, uh, in his target for trying to interfere with their sovereignty. Uh, the Republicans need to be on the right side of history here, and right now they're not. Blocking that supplemental passage in the House of Representatives is playing right into Mr. Putin's hand, and it really does make us extremely vulnerable. If we lose in Ukraine, I can tell you, Mr. Putin's not going to stop with Ukraine. And what we're talking about now is helping a country through our resources rather than having to send our men and women uh, to fight in, on foreign soil. The Republicans need to understand how serious this is and how wrong they are to hold up that Ukraine aid. It's desperate, it's needed now, and there's no excuse for not taking a vote on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. And some military officials have estimated that if that aid doesn't come soon, Russia will soon have a 10 to 1 advantage uh, in terms of military equipment and firepower. Senator, um, let's uh, want to turn you to an issue closer to home, though. That, of course, is the Francis Scott Key Bridge, uh, which collapsed outside of Baltimore just a few weeks ago. You have legislation. Uh, you are going to introduce a bill to pay for it. Tell us what's in it, but also what kind of pushback are you getting from Republicans? Because in those initial days after the uh, tragic accident, there were some from red states who said, hey, why is this our problem? We shouldn't be paying for this. Well, thank you for bringing up the Baltimore Bridge. It was extremely traumatic for our community, a horrific event. We lost six lives. Our port was, is still closed. Uh, we have some traffic, but not enough. Uh, and of course, the bridge needs to be replaced. I will be introducing legislation today with Senator Van Hollen, Congressman Mfume in the House with our entire House delegation, bipartisan legislation to authorize the uh, replacement of the bridge, the cost of replacement at 100% federal share. That's what we've done in the mm -hmm. past. It's a pretty simple bill. We make it clear that any of the recoveries in regards to liable individuals or insurance uh, will go to reimburse the federal taxpayers, but we don't want that to delay the work in getting the bridge replaced. Democratic Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, he's